He is here. God is here among us. Last week, if you were here, we talked about presence, that God is present here among us. God became flesh. He became human and dwelled among us. And we talked about how God literally came down and went camping among us. How cool is that? And so, indeed, God is here among us. He is dwelling with us. But sometimes we go through hard times, even with that knowledge in our, in our minds that God is with us. Uh, about last year, in the last year or so, I had a friend of mine who I met on Facebook call me. Uh, we'll call him Mark. And Mark had said, I, I just need someone to talk to. And so I said, all right, go ahead and call me. I'll listen. I don't know how much help I'll be able to give you, but I, I'd be willing to listen. And he begins to tell me a little bit about his story. As a teenager, he essentially was living out on the streets. He was involved in alcohol, drugs, promiscuity, all those things. He lived a rough life. And as he was hitchhiking one day, uh, a car uh, kind of offered him a lift, and that car, in that car was a Christian missionary who led him to Christ as he was taking him from that spot to wherever it was he was going. And this man's name, or this man, Mark, was, was drastically changed from there on out. He began to go to church and get involved in church, and he began to just devour Scripture. He began to read all sorts of different Christian books, wanting to know all about this God that he had dedicated his life to. He began to get involved in church, involved in the youth group, and he just said, he said, I felt the presence of God in this, this amazing way each and every day of my life. It was shortly thereafter that the pastor of his church came up and talked to him and said, listen, you know, some of these things that you're saying, some of these beliefs that you have, you know, they're not exactly in line with our church. So we're going to have to ask you to stop volunteering with the youth now. And he was hurt. In the next week or so, he, he received some news that his roommate had betrayed him, and, and he, just some, some horrific things happened to him during this time. It was like one thing after another, and, and finally he felt betrayed by God, betrayed by his friends, betrayed by his church, and he said, you know what, I, I'm done with it. And he began to go back to his life of sex and drugs and alcohol. And he lived that life for three years before he was once again sort of came into contact with this man who had led him to Christ all these years before. And after three years, he kind of rededicated his life to Christ. But therein lies the problem, because he said, he said, Matt, I don't sense the same peace with God that I had before. I feel all of the weight of guilt and shame over what I've done, and I don't experience God in my prayer life like I had done before. Can you help me? And I was on the phone, and I, many of the things that he said are completely foreign to my own life, and, and in that moment, I didn't know what to say. I think maybe there are some of you here that maybe you wasn't exactly his life, but you've experienced some things in your life that you're shamed about or you feel guilty about. Maybe things in your past or maybe something that's going on in your life even right now. And you're like, I, I feel guilty about what I'm doing, but I also don't know how to stop. How do, I, how do I find this peace with God? How do I have this vibrant Christian life? We see a lot of shame and guilt in our culture. How many of you ever heard the statement, well, if you knew what I've done, you surely wouldn't be friends with me? Or the people at your church surely wouldn't be friends with me? Or how about if I ever stepped foot in a church, the whole building would come down on me? because of the things that I've done 
in my life. We walk around as a people with a lot of shame and a lot of guilt. And the question is, with the weight of all of this, how do we find peace with God? What do we have to do? You see, this question of what do we have to do was the same question that those in the ancient world were dealing with as well. You see, for them, the question was not, does God exist? There were gods for everything. If you wanted to have a good crop, there's a God for that. If you wanted to win the war that you were going into, there's a God for that. If you wanted to have many children, there's a God for that. There's a God for each and everything, hunting, fishing. There's a God for that. When you look at the Roman and the Greek myths, some of you, especially if you're in high school, maybe some of you were in high school one day, you remember the Greek and the Roman mythology? Those were gods and goddesses, real gods and goddesses that were worshipped in the Greek and Roman worlds. And they went to these gods and goddesses and going on a ship trip, well, you have to sacrifice this. Because the question was not, do they exist, but how do we please them? What do we have to sacrifice so that we don't get in a shipwreck? What do we have to sacrifice so that we can have kids? What do we have to sacrifice so that we will win this war? What do we have to sacrifice so that the harvest is plentiful and that we'll have plenty to eat? And so maybe you would say, all right, I'm going to sacrifice this thing to, to my God, and because of that, He will bless me. But here's the problem. Let's say the God blesses you with an abundant harvest, more than you've ever had before. What happens the next year? Because if you give the same sacrifice that you did the, the year before, I mean, then you might make the God that you worship unhappy. Because what's it? Wait, wait, I blessed you with this abundant harvest, and you're giving me the same thing that you gave me last year? Shouldn't you give me more? So in, in the mind of, of these people who are worshiping the gods, it's like, well, how much more do I give? I don't know. Do I give more? Do I give the same? And how much more do I give? Or perhaps, let's say this. You sacrificed to your God, and it, there was a drought. Your crop wasn't that great. Then what? Well, I gave, you know, five pigs last year or five cows last year. That must not have been enough, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to increase that. I'm going to give even more as a sacrifice to my God. But let's say that doesn't work. Let's say the drought continues, and you have to keep sacrificing more and more and more. Some uh, in the ancient world even said, you know what, to, to prove my devotion to my God, it's not enough just that I sacrifice my sheep and my goats and my cows. I'm going to literally cut myself and to show my devotion to my God. You can see how, how dedicated I am to you, and they would cut themselves, and literally their own blood would run. But what happens if the drought continues? And in some in the ancient world, if you ever see the followers of Molech, one of the things that they would do is say, I've already cut myself, and so here I'm going to sacrifice my children to my God. These were part of the detestable practices of the Canaanites. We can see this in other cultures as well. The Incan culture, same thing. Or they would sacrifice slaves, or they would sacrifice those they've taken in combat. But here's the thing. They never truly knew whether they were going to appease 
their God or not. That was this one underlying fundamental flaw in their sacrificial system. They never knew whether they were truly being pleasing to their God. Now, there were attempts made that that, that if I was a father and, and if I knew that, okay, 20 years ago we had a drought, son, and this is what I sacrificed. And, and so part of that would be writing it down and passing on that knowledge to my son. And through the generations, it would kind of pass from father to son and father to son, down through the generations. Like this has worked in the past, and maybe it will work again. If you have a really good harvest, this is what you give. Because the fundamental question they were asking was this, how do we please our God? So then along comes a man named Abraham. Now, the story of Abraham is tremendous, and and it starts with something that we often overlook because we take it for granted. But in that world, it would have been so revolutionary. What's God's first interaction with Abraham? God speaks to Abraham. In the ancient world, that was like craziness. Like, wait, your God speaks to you? We, we can't draw that close to God, and yet you say your God has spoken to you? And God says this, I want you to leave your father's household. What is he ultimately asking of Abraham? Leave this old sacrificial system behind. Yes, you know, leave that which I've, I've always, you've always known. Go to this land that I'm telling you. But a part of that was leave this system of sacrifices. I don't want you to be a part of this system anymore. And so Abraham leaves. He leaves that old system behind as an act of faithfulness to God. Later on, God tells Abraham, I want you to sacrifice your son, Isaac, to me. Have anyone ever thought it was weird that that Abraham doesn't protest? Now, he doesn't understand it, but he just goes with it. Because in that culture, such a request was not uncommon for a God to ask of his follower. So Abraham goes up on the mountain, and as they're going up, and he's not understanding, like, how is my offspring going to come through Isaac, and yet I'm supposed to sacrifice him to God? And, and he's not understanding how this is happening, but he's acting in faith, and he goes up, and, and just before he's about to sacrifice his son, God stops him, stops him from killing his child, sacrificing his child. So in another way, he's calling him out of that sacrificial system as well. No more will you sacrifice your children to me. But even more important, and this is something that we'll come back to, God provides a ram. And it was said, God said, listen, sacrifice this ram instead. And it was said about that place, it says, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. And so Abraham takes this ram that God has provided and sacrifices it to God. We continue to see this revolutionary nature of how God interacts with his people through the Israelites. Those books that we we really don't necessarily read all the time, Leviticus, some of you may be monthly devotions, I know. But we like, it's like, okay, you've done this, so sacrifice this. You've done this, so sacrifice this. You're, you're happy about what's happened, the grain offering, you know, you're happy about your crop, sacrifice this. Now, we look at, back at this and we're like, well, how crazy is that? How complicated is that? But for the Israelites, this was an act of tremendous grace because they knew exactly what God demanded of them. Okay, I've, I've done this. Sin, I know what to sacrifice. There's no more guessing. You don't have to guess, well, did I give enough? No. God has said, this is what I'm to do, and I've done it. I've had a bountiful harvest. I know exactly what I have to give to God. God. 
Do you see how it could bring a tremendous amount of peace and relief? Because now the guessing game is over. You know what you have to give God. Now, this is what Hebrews says, Hebrews chapter 10. There's a problem in this system. I know that sounds weird to say, but there's this fundamental flaw in this system as well, and the author of Hebrews brings it out. Chapter 10, verse 11, says, day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. As one uh, pastor I heard speaking about this passage said, wouldn't it have been nice to know that before, before I sacrificed all my sheep and my goats? Now, that's an interesting statement, several interesting statements. These sin offerings, as you take your, your sacrifice up to Jerusalem, and it's baying or mooing or whatever it's doing. It's doing that, but it's also reminding you of your sin. It's this constant, like, this constant act of shaming. Like, remember what you did. And, and the, so the high priest, you'd take your sacrifice and you'd have this ongoing reminder of your sinfulness, and, and you'd take it to the high priest or the priest, and, and literally, especially during like the high Jewish festivals, like there would be thousands, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of sacrifices during these, these Jewish feasts. And the priest would literally stand there all day long sacrificing one after another, after another, after another, all day long. He stands sacrificing these animals. And then something else happens. The author of Hebrews says this, verses 12, but when the priest talking about Jesus. But when this priest, Jesus, had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool, because by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. I, just one chapter before the author of Hebrews says it this way, at the culmination of the ages, I love Paul, at just the right time, when we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ was willing to sacrifice himself. He was not just the, the priest, he was also the sacrifice. Now, here's the interesting little tidbit to take home with you, to win all your trivia pursuit games when you're talking about the Bible on the exact same mountain where God spared Abraham's son Isaac, God sacrificed his own son. And it is said that on the mountain of the Lord, God will provide. And it says another interesting statement, that after this is all over, it says, Jesus Christ sat down. Now, it's one of those lines that we can often like just bypass, because we don't understand what that means. We just, oh, it's just Jesus sat down, the high priest stood up, okay, that's interesting little piece of history. But there's a lot of deeper, richer meaning in what that means. You see, as the high priest stood, he was sacrificing. The work of sacrifices continued day after day and week after week. But Jesus sat down indicating what? What? 
the work is over. All of that sin, you no longer have to remember. Why? Because I dealt with it there. It's done. You don't have to be reminded of your sins. Why? Because it's there. It is done. You don't have to worry about how you make peace with me. It is finished. But the story doesn't end in death. It ends in new life. Jesus conquers the grave, comes back to life. Paul says if we've shared in the death of Christ, we will share with the resurrection. What does that mean? That God gives us new life through his Spirit. God wants to breathe new life into our dead, dreary, dry bones. And it also means this, that we can approach the throne of grace with confidence. That's what the author of Hebrews says. Because of what Jesus accomplished, because of what he did, you too can draw near to God. Show me another world religion where that can happen. That we can have an intimate relationship with the God who created everything. God invites us near to him. So my friend Mark, as I sat there listening to his story, having no idea what I'm going to say that will bring him any amount of peace or assurance. And I felt the Holy Spirit guiding me to say something. I said, I said Mark, ha- have you confessed your sins? He said, yes, I've confessed. I said, if you have confessed your sins then he is faithful and just and has forgiven you. Mark, your sins have been forgiven. And again I said, Mark, you have confessed. And if you have confessed, then he is faithful and just and has forgiven your sins. Mark, you are forgiven. And I said again, Mark, if you have confessed your sins, then he is faithful and just and has forgiven your sins. Mark, you are forgiven. And I heard silence and then weeping as he said, I have never before heard those words of blessing. And he begins to weep and cry. He says, Matt, I felt a a peace like I've never felt since before. See, Mark had been carrying around a tremendous amount of shame and guilt over what had happened, what he had done. And he struggled with, how do I make peace? And Jesus tells him, it's nothing you've done. It's all what I have done already. I wonder this morning, if you've been struggling with some amount of guilt or shame over something you've done in your life, I know I have. I know that there are things in my life, things that I've done that's been an ongoing, like, I, I just want to forget about this. I want to, you know, it, it still brings me shame and guilt. I think we all at times may have things that we're just like, I wish I could just forget that. And we feel guilty and we feel ashamed. And God says, I've taken care of it. It's forgiven. Be at peace. I wonder this morning if there's any one of us here today that says, you know what? I've struggled with shame. I've struggled with guilt over something that I've done. And I wonder if you would say, I want this new life.
I want the peace that is offered through Jesus, through the power of his Holy Spirit. I want this peace in my life. Or, or maybe you're here this morning and you've, you're like, I, I'm not a Christian. I don't know what that means. But I, man, I, I have suffered a lot of my life. I've done a lot of things. And you know what? I want to be set free of that. I'm tired of carrying around this guilt. It doesn't matter what you've done. Jesus took care of it. And if Jesus can save Paul, a man who persecuted Christians, it doesn't matter what you've done. Or maybe here this morning, and you would say this, you know, I'm struggling physically in some way, and I need some word of blessing. I need someone to pray for me. Maybe it's not physically, maybe it's emotionally. I don't know what is holding you back today, what baggage that you're carrying on your shoulder, but God says, come be free. Or maybe your desire this morning is this, God, as an act of thankfulness for what you did for me and the fact that you have sat down, Father, I want to draw nearer to you. So maybe this morning is simply about rededicating your life or saying, God, give me more. I want to be drawn closer to you even than I have before. Maybe that's your desire this morning. Or maybe this morning you just say, you know what? I need to hear some words of blessing. I would invite you forward in just a moment. As the worship team comes, we just want to speak some words of blessing over you. If you would like to, to give us something specific to pray about, that's great, that's fine, we'll do that, we'll pray with you, we'll bless you, but we just want to bless you to hear those words spoken of blessing and of hope and of new life. Will you stand as the worship team leads us? And if you're interested in hearing a word of blessing or having a prayer, we invite you forward. Come find new life, new breath.